Well, good morning. This is Professor Mark Smith for History 111, Sections 1 through 12. I hope you're all doing well. We are nearing the completion of our course on the United States to 1865. And this week we're going to be dealing with two topics. Uh, the coming of the Civil War, which is the topic today, which focuses largely on the 1850s. And then our next lecture will be dedicated to succession, which is those few months that lead up to the Civil War. And because of the complexity of succession, I've dedicated a separate lecture to it. And then the final lecture will be after that, and we will look at the actual fighting of the Civil War and conclude with a discussion about emancipation. So this lecture is the lecture for April the 20th, and it details the coming of the Civil War, really focusing on the 1850s. We looked at some of the background of the Civil War in our last lecture in the context of westward expansion, but we're really going to drill down today on the 1850s in particular. Um, there's only one set of terms, that is to say uh, there are no overheads today, uh, but I do want to direct your attention to the terms and the table underneath the terms which details party affiliation in the House of Representatives by region in 1850. And I want to talk about that later on, um, because that's quite an important table for helping us understand why the Civil War came, and most importantly, when it did. So this lecture is divided into two. Um, the first is a general discussion about competing versions of freedom between the North and South. And the second is uh, more detailed. We look at um, the disruption in Kansas to the Revolution of 1860, the Revolution of 1860 being the beginning of succession. And we're going to pick that, up, that conversation up in the next lecture. So in general terms, what I want to do is answer two basic questions today. Um, they're very simple, but the answers are quite complex. The first question is, what were really the main political developments that led to the Civil War? And we've dealt with some of those in our last lecture, but we're going to really focus on the decade 1850 to 1860 today. And then the second question is really, um, to what extent did the similarities or the differences between North and South exacerbate sectional tensions? And I think it's important to bear in mind that just because two places are different doesn't mean that they will go to war. Um, lots of wars have been fought between very similar societies throughout history. So difference itself doesn't necessarily lead to war, um, and neither does similarity avoid war. So as with all historical problems, the devil tends to be in the details. And this is really a story of increasing sectionalism. And you'll hear me use that word a few times this lecture, sectionalism. Sectionalism being the evolving consciousness of a section of the country that is different to another section in, in that same country. This is a civil war, after all, that we're looking at. And sectionalism is an important way to understand the coming of the Civil War because it does um, create that division, because you can't have a Civil War without a division. And sectionalism is the consciousness of section as distinct and different and ultimately um, either uh, under threat or superior. So, um, we're going to miss out a lot here. Uh, we could do a whole course on just the 1850s. We're not going to talk about tariffs, and we're not going to talk about John Brown, and there's lots of other things we could talk about. Uh, but I really want to focus on some of the things that I think are um, deeply important to understanding the coming of the Civil War in the 10 years before the outbreak of war. So let me talk about the first... Uh, section of this lecture, 
And I've entitled this Competing Freedoms. And I really want to use this as an opportunity to refresh our collective memories here and to make a basic point. And the basic point is that really until about 1830, roughly 1830, I think it's fair to say that the North and the South um, shared a, a view of the world that was embedded in a, a sentiment of deference, um, a belief in an organic social structure that people should be deferential to their leaders. Uh, this is a, a kind of deferential republicanism that was shared by leaders in the North and the South. It is the idea that people, that, or that, that America had a, a cadre of natural leaders. Uh, this was an organic society in which classes existed, that they were beneficial, and that the leaders were best led by the intelligence and refinement of natural leaders. And this was a view held by elites in the North and the South at the same time. And they also believed, um, they shared a common belief in the, the desirability of progress and the empowerment of this new independent nation. Now, that broad agreement, that concord, if you will, begins to splinter, as we have seen, beginning in the 1830s. In the North, we have the rise of free wage labor ideology. We have a shift from a kind of semi-subsistence to a, a more robust market economy. We have a redefinition of republicanism with the extension of democracy um, so that the idea of a natural aristocracy begins to be replaced by the idea of a democracy um, a more broadly based political form of leadership. We have the emergence in the North of abolitionism, uh, a, a moral and economic attack on slavery, um, the idea that slavery was economically inefficient and therefore retarded the entire economic growth of the country, not just the South. And of course, in the South, we have the reaction that slavery is in fact a positive good. It was no longer a necessary evil, but slavery was a positive good, as we saw when we discussed the slave uh, pro-slavery ideologues. Um, and we also have in the in the South the the growing fear of slave revolts, nullification, and the idea of states' rights. So that by the mid-1830s, we really have two competing definitions of freedom emerging in the United States. In the North, we have the idea of freedom as being defined by the freedom to sell one's labor and the rise of democratic participation for property holders and increasingly non-property holders as long as they were white and male. And in the South, we have the idea that freedom is really contingent on the existence of the unfree. That is, slavery is the guarantor of a broadly shared sense of freedom. The South fears excessive democracy. It certainly does not want an expansive democracy and tends to hold on longer to that pre-1830 view of the world which applauds the organic and deferential society. So, in a way, the South tends to remain culturally and socially and politically in the past, whereas the North is embracing a new and different view of uh, the nation's future. So, there's a question here, of course. If what I just said is true, which I think it largely is, um, and if this was beginning, this division between North and South was beginning in the 1830s, the question is, why wasn't there a civil war in the 1840s? Why wasn't there a civil war in the 1850s? And that's a reasonable question, because if these divisions are occurring, why was there no civil war? I'm going to give you an answer, um, and the answer has to do with the way that political parties operated between 1830 and the outbreak of war. 
And the way that these two political parties operate served essentially to dilute sectionalism, uh, dilute the idea of an exclusive South and an exclusive North. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail later on, but I want to raise the issue now. Because the two-party system essentially enabled Americans to navigate sectionalism and avoid civil war for about 30 years. And it was this two-party system that was critical for deferring the civil war. Because it certainly could have happened in the 1840s, and it certainly could have happened in the 1850s, but this two-party system... Um, fundamentally allowed the idea that these two sections could compromise. And the reason why the two-party system did this is because the two parties, the Democrats and the Whigs, they operated in both sections. That is to say you had Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats. You had Southern Whigs and you had Northern Whigs. And as long as you had those parties in both sections they could diffuse any tension that would be sectional and make it party tension. And that really was the key to um, deferring and diffusing sectionalism for about 30 years. Who were the Democrats? The Democrats um, tended to be pro-democracy. They tended to look to the past um, economically. Uh, they believed in government intervention to protect the liberty of the individual, but they were not terribly sympathetic to um, robust uh, corporate capitalism, if you will. The Whigs, they tended to look to the future economically. Um, they were very pro-capitalist. They supported banks. They, they supported free markets. They were big supporters of internal improvements that facilitated capitalist expansion. Uh, but they tended to look to the past um, when it came to politics. They were fearful of excessive democracy. Um, but the point I really wish to stress here is that this two-party system, as long as it existed in both the North and the South, as long as there were Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, as long as there were Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs, this allowed the party system to diffuse sectional tension so that any issues that did come up were uh, discussed in a party context and not in a sectional context. And this is important for understanding why and when, especially when, sectionalism rears its ugly head. And it can only really occur when that two-party system between Democrats and Whigs collapses. So let's keep an eye out for when it collapses, because that's when you're going to see a very quick transition into sectionalism and ultimately the Civil War. Now, as I said last time, one of the problems that faced the two-party system and America generally was mounting sectional tension over westward expansion. And I noted the problem, uh, the problems that arose after the Mexican War. Um, the next problem that came up was California. And California um, posed the same problem as before, I suppose, as with other states. Uh, would it be admitted to the Union as a free or as a slave state? And the terms of the admission of California, which um, America acquired as a result of the Mexican War, the terms of admission of California were quite important because California would disrupt the delicate balance of free or slave states in Congress. We're back to the old problem of political authority. In 1850, it was very clear um, to most people that California wanted to be admitted to the Union as a free state. Slavery was not pronounced in California. It didn't see itself as a slave state, and it didn't see itself as part of the Cotton South. The South, as I've mentioned before, wanted to block this admission of any state, but especially California and its size, um, to the Union as a free state, because they believed, Southerners believed, that it was their right to expand slavery into the future. It was their constitutional right as they understood it. 
In 1850, it seemed like America was at an impasse on the question of California. The residents of California seemed to want to come in as a free state. Southern politicians and statesmen did not want to admit California as a free state, and they argued that Congress had no authority to legislate slavery out of the territory of California. And so predictably, perhaps, uh, a compromise was offered. A compromise was offered by our old friend Henry Clay in 1850, and it's known simply as the Compromise of 1850. It really is not a single bill. Um, in fact, you won't find any reference to the Compromise of 1850 in the Congressional Record. It was a list of five separate bills that dealt with the California issue. Um, but nonetheless, historians refer to it as the Compromise of 1850. I'm going to give you uh, some of the most important provisions of the Compromise of 1850. First, and most obviously, the Compromise of 1850 admitted California as a free state to the Union. So California was admitted as a, as a free state to the Union, thus mollifying the North, making the North happy. Secondly, in an effort to persuade the South and give the South something in return for the admission of California as a free state, uh, it was agreed by the Compromise of 1850 that the United States government would assume the debts of the slave state of Texas that Texas had incurred during the war against Mexico. This is a relatively minor uh, provision um, and intended to give the South something that they wanted, especially Texans. A much more important, or at least emotionally important, provision um, that was designed to pacify the South um, in light of the admission of California as a free state was the introduction of a new and stringent Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. This is part of the Compromise of 1850. And the Fugitive Slave Act would facilitate the efforts of slave owners to reclaim slaves who had escaped to the free areas of the North. And this was a point of real contention between the North and South, because prior to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, slave owners could not really reclaim their slaves without the help of federal marshals. And many slave owners felt that Northerners were helping slaves escape to the North and keeping them hidden. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 changed this. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 put the burden of proof on captured slaves to prove that they had actually been born free, um, if they had, in fact, been born free, um, but didn't really give those folks any real legal power to prove their freedom. Instead, a southern slave owner could bring an alleged slave fugitive before a federal commission and simply claim ownership. So in other words, a slave owner could go to Massachusetts, identify an African American who may well be free in Massachusetts, but simply identify that person as his slave and take his claim before a federal commission. All he needed under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 to prove ownership of this alleged slave was an affidavit from a slave state, the testimony of a white witness, a family member, anyone really. And there was lots of room for abuse, of course. Moreover, um, as a provision of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, if the Federal Commission decided against the slave owner, uh, the commissioner received a fee of $5. If the commission uh, agreed with the slave owner, they received a fee of $10. And this looked to Northerners like a shameless bribe to commissioners to side with the slave owner in his claim that an individual was, in fact, an escaped slave. Um, there were other provisions, too. Uh, the, the law, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, required marshals and U.S. marshals and deputies to help slave owners capture their slaves. 
um, and impose stiff criminal penalties on anyone found harboring a fugitive slave. Now, from the southern perspective, this law worked because in the first 15 months after its passage, 84 fugitives were returned to slavery and only five were released. So it certainly worked from the slaveholders' perspective because they could claim more instances of fugitives, even if the instances were bogus, um, and they tended to prevail in the court with the commissioner. But in the north... This act and its implementation uh, caused enormous ruckus. Uh, Northerners were outraged at this uh, provision, and it simply strengthened the perception of the slave power, the thing that we mentioned last time, the idea that the federal government had been captured by Southerners. And this revolted abolitionists in particular and heightened anti-Southern sentiment. And frankly, from the perspective of slave owners, while they liked it, this was really very small compensation for the admission of California as a free state to the Union. One other provision I want to mention is that um, the 1850, the Compromise of 1850, abolished the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Not slavery itself, but the slave trade. So you couldn't buy or sell slaves in the nation's capital. This was designed to pacify the North because they were outraged that slavery, uh, slaves could be traded in the nation's capital. Um, as an omnibus bill, as a bill that combined all of these provisions, the, the uh, Compromise of 1850 failed, and that was Clay's mismanagement, really. However, it succeeded when Stephen A. Douglas, a Democrat from Illinois, broke up all of this legislation and succeeded in getting them through the House and the Senate as separate bills. So this was a, a significant achievement for Douglas, Stephen Douglas, who broke up the provisions and got them through as individual bills. That's why you won't see anything called the Compromise of 1850, because they were really just separate bills. Now, what was the main impact of the Compromise of 1850? Well, frankly, it simply served to defer later conflict. Um, and importantly, from our perspective, it really hurt the Whig Party because the Whig Party was very split over these various provisions of the Compromise of 1850. And it really weakened them to the point where the Whig Party starts to decline precipitously. Uh, so it deferred later conflict. It really weakened the Whig Party. And in effect, the Compromise of 1850 served to increase sectional consciousness. Um, that's why I've given you that party breakdown um, with your list of terms. If you look at this list of terms, uh, this, this party rather, uh, the table details party affiliation in the House of Representatives by region in 1850, um, if you look at this, you can see that the Democrats operate in the North and the South fairly evenly. Um, the Whigs become increasingly more Northern and less Southern. But the really important line is the last line. And that's something called the Free Soil Party. It's a brand new party. It's not very powerful in 1850. It will become so. But in 1850, this Free Soil Party is beginning to emerge. And this Free, free Soil Party will later become known as the Republican Party. And while it is small in 1850 in the House of Representatives, note the critical fact. Its presence is entirely northern. There's not a si single Free Soil representative in the south. Every one of them is in the north. And that's an important fact to bear in mind as we go through this because that is the beginning of the breakdown of the two-party system. Now let me move on to our second part of the lecture, and that is from Kansas to the Revolution of 1860. So, um, essentially, the Compromise of 1850 created a context or a circumstance that allowed politicians to offer three broad stances, three broad positions that they could talk to voters when discussing slavery and its expansion. 
And we're going to take you through these three broad positions and identify the main leader of each position. Um, and keep these, these positions in mind because they come to inform party politics. The first position um, is known as the Free Soil Doctrine. The free Soil Doctrine. These are just basically ways of looking at the problem that's, that politicians could use. So the Free Soil Doctrine is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the Free Soil Doctrine argued that it was the duty of Congress to prevent any further expansion of slavery in the West. Basically, these are the free soilers that I just mentioned. Keep the soil free not slave. These folks were big supporters, predictably, of the Wilmot Proviso that we discussed last lecture. And essentially they insisted that there shouldn't be any more concessions made to slavery in the territories. It was mainly associated with Salmon Chase of Ohio, um, who was the principal leader of the Free Soil Party in the early 1850s, and by the mid-1850s, this free, free soil doctrine had become the rallying cry of people who had been in the Whig Party, um, some Democrats, basically people in the North who were adamantly opposed to slavery. And it was this doctrine um, that became the centerpiece of the larger Republican Party later on, um, which rises to preeminence in, what, 1856 to 60. So the Free Soil Doctrine is really the basis of the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. The second position that politicians could take um, in light of the 1850 Compromise and throughout the 1850s was the States' Rights Doctrine, the States' Rights Doctrine. Predictably, this is the southern counterpart to Free Soilers. And they insisted that the federal government had no authority whatsoever to rule on the question of slavery in the territories. The main advocate of the state's, doctrine, state's rights doctrine, of course, was John C. Calhoun. And then it was carried on by Robert Barnwell Rett, also of South Carolina, um, in the 1850s. And then the third position that politicians could adopt or assume in the 1850s cleaved towards the doctrine of popular sovereignty. The doctrine of popular sovereignty. Um, the basic idea of popular sovereignty is that the question of slavery should be decided by those living in the territories. And the champion of this, this perspective, this doctrine, was Stephen Douglas of Illinois. And to many people, this seemed like a good and reliable answer. I mean, it sounds democratic that uh, people in a territory can petition for membership in the Union, and it's those people who decide whether or not they're going to join the Union as a slave state or as a free state. Um, the idea was interesting and not without merit, but the application of popular sovereignty was deeply problematic and we see the problems of popular sovereignty when we look at the problem of Kansas in 1853, 54 and 55. Um, and by 1853 the, the, the territorial question in Kansas had emerged and essentially the question is what to do with the Kansas-Nebraska territory that had been acquired from the Mexican War. And this question, especially in Kansas, was applied to, or the, the, the question of admission of Kansas, uh, popular sovereignty was the test case. So the question of Kansas was really popular sovereignty in action. Let the inhabitants decide. Okay, let them decide. Interestingly, and perhaps predictably, um, popular sovereignty failed in Kansas for the simple reason that the process could be so manipulated. So what you have, um, when Kansas is petitioning to join the Union, and they're going to vote whether or not they're going to join as a slave state or as a free state, 
You have lots of outsiders coming to Kansas. You have lots of pro-slavery southern forces converging on Kansas, getting there by train, by horse. And then you have lots of anti-slavery northern forces also converging on Kansas. And what they're trying to do is turn the vote, turn the vote to their favor. They're trying to rig the result, really, through mass immigration to Kansas. And the groups lived side by side, southern pro-slavery um, forces and anti-slavery northern forces lived side by side, very often very violently. In fact, it was so violent, the battles, the killings, the muggings, the murders, um, that they lasted really until 1858. And that is the origin of the term bleeding Kansas. Kansas was so bloody um, because of these warring factions that were trying to uh, push Kansas into the Union either as a slave state or as a free state. Uh, Kansas was not admitted to the Union um, until 1861 and it came in as a free state. Now bear this context in mind. You have these people fighting these bloody gory battles in Kansas in an effort to shift Kansas as a slave state or as a free state and admit it to the Union. In the middle of all this, an incident occurs in the United States Senate that further disrupts the parties and does nothing to ease sectional tensions. In fact, it does a great deal to exacerbate sectionalism. What was this event? I'm going to take you through it. On May the 19th, 1856, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was a vehement and outspoken critic of slavery, hated slavery, on the floor of the Senate he delivered a speech, and the speech was called The Crime Against Kansas. And the speech was uh, vituperative, passionate, and included a very personal attack on his fellow senator from South Carolina, Andrew P. Butler. And Sumner in his speech refers to Senator Butler as a Don Quixote. Um, and he says that Butler has, quote, chosen a mistress to whom he has made his vows, and who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight. She is the harlot slavery. Now, even by our standards, these are fairly strong words, but certainly by the standards of the 1850s, this speech was um, very strong. These, these are rough and boisterous insults thrown by one senator to another. This speech was born of Sumner's um, absolute loathing of slavery, and he projected that loathing onto a senator from South Carolina. Now, this speech infuriated lots of people, especially in the South, but no, none more so than Butler's cousin, Representative Preston Brooks, who was from Edgefield, South Carolina. That was his district. He was a graduate of South Carolina College in 1839. And Preston Brooks is extraordinarily aggravated by Sumner's attack on his cousin. So two days after Sumner's speech, Brooks enters the Senate and approaches Sumner and says to him, Mr. Sumner, I have read your speech with care, and I feel it my duty to tell you that you have libeled my state and slandered a relative. Now, had Preston Brooks considered Sumner a gentleman, he would have challenged him to a duel. But Brooks did not consider Sumner a gentleman, and he thought he was unworthy of a duel, but he thought he was worthy of punishment. And so Brooks then proceeded to beat Sumner senseless with the head of his cane. Brooks continued the attack even after his cane had shattered until he was seized by a northern congressman. 
and the Brooks' friends quietly led him away out of the Senate. And on the floor they charged Sumner, bleeding profusely. This wasn't just a tap with the cane. This was a beating. This was a violent beating. It took Sumner over a year to return to the Senate. There were efforts to expel Brooks from the House of Representatives, and he was in fact fined $300, but he was promptly re-elected by the citizens of Edgefield County, South Carolina, who sent him gifts, most notably hundreds of new canes to replace the one that had broken on Sumner's skull. This event served to polarize the North and the South in really raw emotional terms. The beating of Sumner really symbolized to many what the South was and what the North was. Southerners saw Brooks's actions as defending Southern honor. That's why they gave him the canes, I suppose. Defending Southern honor from an insulting North from an arrogant North. And Northerners, in turn, saw this attack, this beating of a senator, one of their senators, as typical of a barbarous South that enjoyed the violence of slavery. And the event made it much harder to compromise because it gave extremists from both sections a great deal of ammunition. And in particular, the beneficiaries of both the fighting in Kansas and the caning of Sumner um, were the new Republican Party. This was really a godsend for this new political force in the, in the, in the North. I mean, bear in mind the Republican Party is brand new. It's formed in 1854 and it's formed by old free soilers and old Whigs and lots of other disparate groups, abolitionists, anti-slavery supporters. But the key thing to understand about the Republican Party is that it's purely sectional. There's no Republican Party in the South. It is a purely sectional party. Its strength resides exclusively in Northern support. It draws its entire support from the North. And this is really the key. The formation of the Republican Party in 1854 as a purely sectional party begins the end of the two-party system, the system that had kept the country together, the system that had diluted sectional tension. Once the Republican Party is formed in 1854 as a purely sectional party with no Southern support at all, that's when that system begins to collapse very rapidly and you get the, the emergence of a rabid and real and enduring sectionalism. And they were very successful. The Republicans were extremely successful. By 1858, just four years after its founding, the Republican Party controls the House of Representatives. And their credo, their belief is very simple. Free soil, free labor, free men. Now, some members of the Republican Party were rabid abolitionists. Others were more moderate. Others were not against slavery per se. They just didn't want it expanding into new territories. But what they could all agree on was that um, free soil, free labor, free men should be the future direction of the United States. They wanted to define America as a free wage labor nation. And ultimately, that was going to place them at odds with the South. And they had the power to do this. It took just four years for this brand new party to control the House of Representatives. Why? Because the North was populating at a much faster rate than the South. So let me conclude with a few words on what was known as the Revolution of 1860. And we're going to talk more about that next lecture, but I want to say a few words about this revolution of 1860 now.
So at the beginning of the Republican nomination for um, the presidential campaign, um, it seemed like this this tall, lanky lawyer, Abraham Lincoln, was really a long shot to win the nomination of the Republican Party. In fact, the favoured candidate was Stephen Douglas. But during a series of very interesting and very um, intelligent and rousing debates between Douglas and Lincoln, Lincoln showed himself to be better prepared, more thoughtful. Douglas, too, had the liability of the failed uh, popular sovereignty doctrine, remember, that hadn't really worked, and uh, people came to blame Douglas for the, that failure. And Lincoln struck a more conciliatory and sensible tone to the ears of many, um, many members of the Republican Party. Because Lincoln made it clear, and I want you to keep this in mind um, before we go into the next lecture on succession, Lincoln made it very clear in these debates that he did not intend to interfere with slavery where it existed. So he said, I'm not going to attack slavery in South Carolina or Mississippi or Georgia. Okay. He said, it's fine where it is. But in these debates with Douglas, he did say that he wanted to ex stop its expansion. To stop its expansion. And it was that message that resonated most powerfully with the Republican Party. And he got the nomination and then he won the presidency. And on November the 6th, 1860, he is elected president. The election of Abraham Lincoln was perceived to be a revolution for several reasons. And it's important to understand just how profound Lincoln's election was. Um, and I'm going to give you four reasons why Southerners in particular, but not just Southerners, Northerners too, uh, agreed with some of this. Why they saw it as a revolutionary moment. The first reason why they referred to the election of 1860 as a revolution is that Lincoln and the Republican Party won by a purely sectional vote. Lincoln did not carry a single southern state. The support from the north and the west proved sufficient to elevate him to the presidency. This was unprecedented. Previously, Democrats and Whigs had competed in an intersectional fashion to win elections. But not now. The Republican Party had enough power in the North and with the Western states to be able to not just control the House of Representatives, but the presidency itself. So that's one reason why it was perceived to be a revolution. The second, and more simply, I suppose, is that this brand new political party, this Republican Party, had won its first presidential election within six years of its formation. This was unprecedented. This was remarkable. Brand new party, and it won its first presidential election. The third reason why it was perceived to be a revolution, and this is especially true um, from the Southern perspective, is that Southerners saw the election of a free soil, free labor, free men president as a revolution. This was revolutionary insofar as it represented a grave and express threat to slavery's expansion. And southern slaveholders uh, saw this as a revolution, as an attack on their society. This was a revolution that was going to upend their society as they perceived it. Now, whether or not Lincoln um, was as clear on some of these issues as southerners believed is up for debate, and we'll talk about that next lecture. But that's certainly their perception, that this is a revolutionary moment. And then lastly, um, importantly, um, the reason why Southerners saw this as a revolution is that the South had lost control of the presidency. They no longer had the numbers, the power, to secure the presidency, the executive. And for that reason, increasingly, after November of 1860, Southerners increasingly thought that 
that it will be safer for them to exist outside of this union rather than remain in it. And how that plays out, how that unfolds beginning with South Carolina um, and leading into uh, the outbreak of war is the subject of our next lecture. So until then, uh, stay safe and we will talk soon.